And so this wilderness journey is a journey of our life of faith, as we have uh, spoken about. Egypt represents the world, as we see in Revelation 11, 8. The world that stands against God is represented by Egypt. We have been called out of Egypt and called into the wilderness to become the church and the congregation of our God. Here, we are being trained as God's people, and our aim is to enter into Canaan. There are five stages of the wilderness journey, and we have gone through actually first three stages from previous lecturers. Stage one starts from camp one to 10. Um, the Israelites came out of Egypt. They crossed the Red Sea. That's when God really opened up the new pathway for them to totally put their past sins behind, their masters behind, the masters of the world behind. And when they were uh, running, running out of food, God gave them bread from heaven, manna. And also uh, when they were asking for water, God provided water from the rock, a very big event, a rock that provided water for two million people. Then in stage two, uh, from camps 11 to 14, at campsite 11, Mount Sinai, that is the place that God has been waiting there for them. God has called them out of Egypt, waited for them to come to this place where he can ratify a covenant with them and to make them into his people. There, God was ready to really, you know, pull out all of his word to them, help them to build a place, tabernacle, where they can meet with him and learn to worship him and enjoy the fellowship with him. Then they celebrated the first Passover and they took the first census of men of war, uh, men who were aged above 20, and the number came out to be 603, 550, 603,550 men. And then God brought them to campsite 14, Rezma, which is also known as Kadesh Barnea. And there, what was God's intention? Set the land before them, right? God showed them, this is right at the door of the promised land. Enter in, go in, take possession. You dwell with me, become my people. But because of human thoughts, human ways, they decided to spy out the land for 40 days. Okay? As a result of their grumblings and disbelief, God sentenced them to a uh, total of 40 years in the wilderness journey. And then we came to stage three where they had to go around, remain back at the same place, but go round and round around the same similar region and come back to the same place after many years. So today we're going to continue on from there. So when they um, came back to Kadesh Barnea after 38 years, they camped 18 times. And Kadesh Barnea, as I mentioned earlier, was the same place as Ritma, okay, which was also explained by other lecturers uh, why they are the same place. They came back to the same place full of emotions because... Um, this is the very place that they got sentenced to a 40 year, total 40-year journey. And now, before the same place, before the same piece of land that they are facing, are they now able to enter in? They are supposed to be able to. They are supposed to be ready because God has already trained them through the 38 years. Now, think about it. Um, how do you feel when you're at 20 years of age? high hopes, a lot of things is going to take place in your life. You have a lot of things you want to try, okay? How about 30 years old? Still very good. 40? I would say until 50, still feeling very good, <laughs> right? They say that the 50s are the new 30s in this era, right? So it's no problem if I am still 50 years old and I, I want to... I'm ready to conquer this land and go in and take possession. But this is 38 years later. If I was 20, I would be 58 now. Maybe not so bad because new, the new 60s are the 60s are the new 40s probably. But if I am, if I was 50, I would be 88. Would I still be alive? <laughs> Even if I have the mind of a young person, I can't. I can't. Right. So. Ecclesiastes 12, verse 1 to 5, tells us that you have to remember your creator while you are young, before the days of trouble come. So we have to serve our God and understand the word when we have our youth, so that we can do many things to bring people to Christ. 
And at this place, God is emphasizing that holiness is an absolute requirement in order to inherit the promised land and to live as his people. So the last time our previous lecturer dropped off uh, at a cliffhanger, so I'll continue from campsite 32 to bring up the events that took place um, at Kadesh. So Kadesh, again, means a sanctified place or holy place. So they arrived here on the first month, 40th year of the Exodus. Okay, so after 38 years, God trained them to be holy people. And these are the two reference verses that tells us that, tells us that God wants us to really pursue holiness in all of our conduct so that we can really meet and fellowship with him. What happened at this place? Here, Miriam died. Miriam is one of the three leaders, right? Sister of Moses and Aaron. She died here. She was judged for her sin of challenging against the divine leadership God had given to Moses. What she did was she elevated herself in the eyes of the people, thinking that she was of equal status as uh, Moses. The second thing that happened here, the Israelites grumbled again because they, they didn't have water. So another water, uh, lack of water incident. And as a result of this second water incident, uh, Moses and Aaron also, they were affected. They received the pronouncement that they would not enter into Canaan. Why? Because during this incident, they did not treat God as holy. And this place, uh, this incident was actually uh, named as the waters of Meribah. Let's read Numbers 20, verse 1 to 2. Okay, I'll read for you. Then the sons of Israel, the whole congregation, came to the wilderness of Zin in the first month, and the people stayed at Kadesh. Now Miriam died there and was buried there. So Miriam died there. Okay. And verse 2 continues on to say, there was no water from the, from the, for the congregation, and they assembled themselves against Moses and Aaron. And the whole episode of this waters of Meribah begin. To so Aaron and Moses, God pronounced to them that you will not enter into Canaan because you did not treat God as holy. That is recorded in verse 12 of the same chapter. What happened? Let's read the verse. And the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, because you did not believe in me to uphold me as holy in the eyes of the people of Israel, therefore you should not bring this assembly into the land that I have given them. Now, if I was, um, I don't know about Aaron. Aaron did quite a few mistakes, but if I was Moses, I would have been very devastated. Because I established this, I mean, I worked with God to establish this nation together, right? Um, brought them out of Egypt. And now, God, you're just saying it because you're angry at this moment, right? I can't answer, right? No, no. God meant it, and Moses really did not enter into the promised land. So let's take a look at the significance of these two rocks. Uh, now, we believe that every, uh, every scripture in the Bible is testifying about Jesus, don't we? As we read in John 5.39 and Luke 24. 1 Corinthians 10, for, uh, I think we also uh, learned from um, various sermons and teachings that 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 10, 4 tells us that that rock um, that the Israelites met and received that water from, that rock was Christ. And that rock was the one that followed them. That was at Rephidim, right? When they first... Um, when God first provided water for, the, for them through the rock. That rock was Christ. And that rock from then on continued to follow them, so they didn't have any water issue until they came to this campsite 32. Again, God tested them. Okay, there was no water. So there are two rocks that, took, uh, that appeared in the wilderness um, that provided water. So once at the first time at Rephidim, the second time at Kadesh. And these two rocks actually were of different shapes as we read the original text. The first rock, I, I'll show you the image in there. Uh, it might be too small, but uh, hopefully you can um, 
relate to it. Okay. So the first rock uh, was in the earlier state of their wilderness journey. So uh, first time, uh, God told Moses to strike the rock. That's in Exodus chapter 17. And that rock uh, that was used there in that uh, passage is uh, sir in Hebrew. It means boulder and a, a big, uh, huge rock um, that's on the ground. Okay. Uh, it's one, um, one piece of rock like this in the picture. Whereas the second rock... Uh, happened later now in this campsite 32 and God says in order to bring forth water you speak to the rock in Numbers 20 and that is asking Moses to seek and to ask okay you just have to ask and God will provide the water that rock um, in, the, in the original language is cellar which means a rock that has cleft uh, cracks or visual so it's, it's a rock that is cracked open uh, split okay so in those times, um, when the, some of them were, uh, you know, seeking for refuge, they would hide themselves in such rocks because they would, you know, become like caves where it's with, with a huge split they could hide inside from their enemies. These two rocks, if they were Christ, we can, we can refer or we can infer or understand from here that the first rock shows us Jesus Christ's first coming, where he was struck for our sins. While we were still ignorant and sinners, God provided Jesus who died for us. Okay. But as we wait for the second coming Christ, we already, our sins are already forgiven. We already know Jesus. We, we have to mature in our faith. We have to release ask and seek God and build that relationship with him instead of being ignorant like a child where God still has to provide for us while we are still sinning. So, true believers, we must remember that Jesus has already suffered the beatings and the brutal death on the cross. He has been broken and scarred. So we must not strike him again with our stubbornness, with our sins. But true believers and mature believers, let us really understand that now the process of being sanctified is only through the word of God and through prayer. I'll carry on to the next uh, nine campsites, which is the last two stages of um, the wilderness journey, and then we'll enter into Canaan. Amen. So is it going to be a smooth last nine campsites, I, I hope, but let's look at it. Okay, so there are two, two stages here. Um, first campsite of the stage four, okay, Mount Hor. So Mount Hor, Hor um, means mountain. So this place, uh, Mount Hor, which is like mountain, mountain, so mountain among mountains. Okay, here, um, Aaron died. So it's the 40th year, first day of the fifth month. Um, why, why Aaron has to die? Okay, he was judged for his three sins. Um, he was the leader of the golden calf worship incident. Okay, he challenged against Moses for marrying a Kushite woman. And in campsite 32 that we just saw, he joined with Moses to strike the rock twice at Kadesh. Uh, reference verses is in Numbers 20 to 20, 23, 24, where we can see that uh, in verse 24, that God says Aaron will be gathered to his people. He shall not enter because he has rebelled against God at the waters of Meribah. And we know that Aaron did not die of a, because he was old or of natural uh, death, uh, but God uh, God told him that he has to, he, he, he has to be gathered to his people at this point in time. Okay. So Aaron was not um, just a priest, right? He was a high priest. So similar to the meaning of this place, mountain among mountains. Okay. He was a great leader, but even a great leader can lose his position if he does not understand God's heart and if there's disobedience. So if God says holiness is required, then it is absolutely the word of God. We must not take the word of God lightly. And a leader needs to lead others to holiness and not fail. Okay. 
In 1 Corinthians 21, sorry, 1 Chronicles 21, we see King David who also became proud and sin against God. Though he repented, he still has to pay for his sins. So the choice is ours when we choose a certain way of doing our own, you know, following according to our own ways. We have to remember that we have to pay for the consequence. Next route is Zalmona. Okay, this is campsite 34. Um, I, I enlarged this uh, map because uh, it's worth taking a closer look, this place. Zalmona means darkness and shady. And uh, actually, there is an arrow that is uh, drawn from, yeah, this way, across, from Mount Hor to uh, Ie Abarim. Okay, so, I mean, to get to that site, how would we go, how would we go about? It would be shortest way to go by that way, right? But uh, you could see the U-shaped arrow that they had to go downwards and come back up. So after Aaron died, uh, they had to mourn for Aaron for 30 days. Of course, they were very uh, devastated and sad that a great leader that has led them through the wilderness journey has died. Okay. But at the same time, um, they realized that they were rejected to pass through a shorter way to get to the other side. So now they have to go through a long route. Um, so their hearts became impatient and darkened. Next, uh, the verse tells us here in Numbers 21, 4, that they set up from Mount Tor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom, and the people became impatient because of the very long, mountainous and difficult route. And that's not all, okay. So then it came to Punan, okay. Punan is just the next campsite, okay. And Punan means sunset and mine pits. So earlier on we read, they became impatient, and the word impatient in the uh, Hebrew language is kasa, which means great despair, to the point that they are so, this, it, to the point that they cannot be comforted. It's really so bad. And in verse five, uh, grumbling started again. And it is, of course, we are saying that we're not surprised that because grumbling is their forte or their expertise, so they can grumble again. But we remember that they had gone through 38 years of training now from the last time they arrived at Rithma. Now they are about to enter in, right? So um, a little grumble might be okay, but what did they grumble? Same old issue. And I think it's even more prickly this time, okay? They ask, why have you brought us out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? How long ago was that that they came out of Egypt? How long was it? 40 years. Why still they are bringing Egypt's memory with them? And then they said, no food, no water, same issues. They focus back on themselves and they say, and we even loathe this miserable food. This food, manna from, from where God gave it, it was bread, living bread from heaven. Now, if, if they say we love this miserable food, it's like saying we don't want to do this Bible study anymore. It's, it's not getting anywhere. It's not making sense. It doesn't help me, okay? How do you think God feels at this point? Numbers chapter 21, verse 5 to 6. Uh, verse 5 is where they uh, recorded their complaints. They are prickly words that they uh, gave to Moses and challenged against God. Then in verse 6, we read that uh, the Lord then sent fairy serpents among the people and they beat the people so that many of the Israelites, they died. Now, is God so cruel so heartless, you know, these are your people. You promised to bring them into the promised land. Why did you allow the serpents, the fairy serpents to come bite them? But we have to realize that if we reject to be under God's protection, that protection cannot cover us, right? So it's not God punishing them, but when we reject God's grace, then that protection, that grace of God cannot cover us. 
So, but God is still gracious. So even when we are, we are refusing and we are rejecting God's protection, God's grace, God still provides a way. So in the later verses, we, we read that God showed them compassion and love and he instructed Moses to make a bronze serpent and to raise it up on a pole so that everyone who is beaten, when he looks at it, he will live. And this is the same... Um, we can, we can remember this incident, we can refer this incident to the same as Jesus being raised up on the cross. And when he was raised up on the cross for our sins, he gave life to all who received him. Let's read that in John chapter 3, verse 14 to 15. As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in him have eternal life. Amen. Isn't it amen? That, yeah because of our stubbornness, it, impos it is impossible for us to receive that life. But because of Jesus, who is raised up on the cross for our sins, we can receive the eternal life. So you might ask, how can Jesus be compared to a serpent? Is Jesus, is it right to say that? Romans 5.12, we know that uh, because of Adam's sin, all of us, all mankind are born with sins. And we have actually received that curse and the venom from the serpent. And Jesus himself being um, the bronze serpent, he's, he's the one who died on the cross for our sins. He took away that sins. He was raised up there on the cross for our sins. So when we looked to the cross of Jesus, and when we believe that that provides that redemption, and all our sins are gone and we receive life. In Revelation chapter 12, verse 9, it continues to talk about the great dragon, the serpent of old. The devil will always try to deceive us and to, to kill us, to kill us spiritually and physically. But when we hold on to Jesus and we look to the cross, that means we don't look to ourselves and our own thinking, then there is eternal life. On campsite 36, Obof, okay, Obof means water skins, wine skins. Now, if their hearts are already darkened and so depressed, okay, then it's, this heart cannot really receive the grace of God. So their hearts need to be renewed again. So the sun needs to rise up again in their hearts. And in Matthew chapter 9, verse 17, okay, we can read this uh, together. Ready, go. Nor do people put new wine into old wineskin, otherwise the wineskins burst, and the wine pours out, and the wineskins are ruined. But they put new wine into fresh wineskins, and both are preserved. We need to have that new wineskin so that we can receive the word of Jesus Christ. When we hold on to our old wineskin, wineskins are made of leather, right, in the, uh, in the times of the Israelites, and they, they put um, wine or water, because water are wineskins. Um, old old wineskins or old leather skins, they are very rigid, okay, very stiff, not stretchable. So it might, it might burst when you pour in the new wine. Okay. And we need to have that renewed heart, that new wine skin, and we, can, we have to ask God to give it to us so that this, this new heart or this new wine skin is new, new leather wine skin. They are soft and they're pliable. Okay. They can stretch. So we need to have a willing heart, a humble heart that is willing to be molded by God's word. Then our hearts, and then the sun can rise again in our hearts. So, wineskins represent our hearts, okay? So, old stubborn ways, old stubborn heart, dry and rigid wineskins, but let us repent and have that willing heart to listen to God's word and to receive his word with a joyful heart. Then we came to, this is the last uh, campsite in stage four, um, Ye Barim, which is also known as Brook Zaret. This place means way of ruins. And here, um, in Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 14 to 16, we, we can um, realize that um, actually 
many funerals uh, took place. Um, all the first generation died except Joshua and Caleb. Let's read in this verse. At the time from our leaving Kadesh Barnea until we crossed the brook Zeret was 38 years, until the entire generation, that is, the men of war, had perished from the camp as the Lord had sworn to them. The entire generation of the men of war. Remember the first census that was taken? This is the number, um, 3,550 men. Except Joshua and Caleb all died. Means 603, 548 died. My math is correct, right? Okay. So the first generation of the men of war all died. Who is the first generation? Um, Why, why, why does God say that first generation have to die before they can enter, you know, they could go on? Who is the first generation? Who is the second generation? Do we remember what the first generation did? They grumbled. They focused on themselves. They let their old self took over, their own interests took over, their whole mind, their whole being. They couldn't listen to what Moses and Aaron were, were telling them. Today, this first generation is our old self. The old self that only focused on ourselves, that only complains, that was, oh, they will always start to complain. The first thing that we do, grumble. Second thing that we do, grumble. The third thing that we do, grumble. This is the old self that has to, has to die, okay? In Colossians 3, verse 9 to 10, Apostle Paul teaches us that, that we have to strip it off. 1 Corinthians 15, 31, we have to learn that example of uh, Apostle Paul's life, that, we, that our old self has to die before the Word of God. We have to die daily. And that second generation, that new self, has to rise up and take possession of the Canaan land. In Galatians 2, 20, it says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. So even as I'm living in the flesh, I live by faith. I live with my heart and my mind and my whole being focusing on the heavenly things, no longer in the flesh. Christ lives in me. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation, that new generation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Amen. This place, uh, Campsite 37, the ways of um, Yerbarim, or Brook Zeret, is also a turning point. So uh, Numbers 21 verse 11 describes this place as a land that faces toward the sunrise or the east in different versions. So the east is where the sun rises. So it represents a new hope, a new march toward Canaan. That new march and new hope begins for the new generation, the second generation. Just as dawn breaks after the darkest hour, this is, you know, the worst thing that could happen. Massive people, number of people died. Okay, but that is the past. Everything goes away, the new has come. In John 3, 3, it says, Jesus says, answered him, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Brothers and sisters, do we want to be born again? We want to see the kingdom of God, amen? So let us really, really seek and long for it. So the next stage, stage five, the last five campsites, we have to really long for the kingdom of God. Okay, and I skip too fast. Okay. Okay. Mm, um, it's not yet at campsite 38, but we'll get there. Okay. So campsite 38, Dibon God, it means to long for. Okay. So the Israelites at this point, after witnessing all the death of the first generation, they are really longing to quickly enter into Canaan so that they, without dying. Right? Without meeting with another massive 
number of deaths. Second Peter 3.12 also tells us that we have to look for and hasten for the coming of the day of the Lord. We have to long for that new heaven, that new earth, as it's spoken in, um, as spoken in Revelation 21, as we are drawing near to the fulfillment of God's redemptive plan. So let's quickly try to enter in. Kensak 39, Almon de Blossheim. It means hidden lump of pressed fix or kick of pressed fix. Now there's a little picture there that shows that kick of pressed fix. And uh, the map, I continue to show the map on the corner to show that we are very near. The, the, the destination is Gilga up there. Okay, very near already. Okay, this is, um, it's been a long and tiring journey and uh, fix or press fix knit into cakes. This is actually, um, during the time of David, it was meant for comforting and strengthening. The reference verses, 1 Samuel chapter 25 and 30, uh, gives us two uh, examples of uh, David uh, who, who needed comfort and strength, and Abigail gave him that kick of press fix. An Egyptian uh, soldier also needed to be revived. Um, so this uh, gave him strength. This food gave him strength. So when we have no more strength um, of our own human ways, we, have, we can find that strength in God's word. Canaan is a place okay, that is full of abundance of figs. When they say, when God says it's a land flowing with milk and honey, at that time that honey in Canaan, okay, uh, not really honey, but figs, um, tastes like honey. Have you eaten figs before? I love, I love to eat it because it really tastes like honey to me. Okay. It's a place full of abundance of figs. Okay. And now at the place where they are at, okay, the purple arrow in the uh, map shows the place where uh, this side of Canaan, and then they, were at, they are at the other side, Almon, Almon de Blafain. When they are there, this, this place of Canaan, this promised land is hidden and revealed by the, mountains, the mountain range of Abarim. So they can see it, and sometimes it's hidden, but sometimes you can see it. So it is getting so close, almost there. Okay. So their heart is full of excitement and in strengthening because so close to it. So to him who conquers God says, I will give you the hidden manna. That hidden manna will strengthen us. So we need to be so close and so longing for that, for that hidden manna. And when we receive it, it will truly strengthen us. Campsite 40. 42 is the total number of campsites, so we're very close already. Hang in there. Mount Abarim, which means regions beyond the river or the sea. On this mountain, God showed Moses all of the promised land. That's recorded in Deuteronomy 34, verses 1, 2, 3. We'll read it. Okay. Then Moses went up from the plains of Moab to Mount Nebo, to the top of Pisgah, which is opposite Jericho. And the Lord showed him all the land. Gilead, as far as Dan, all Naphtali, the land of Ephraim and Manasseh, all the land of Judah, as far as the western sea, the Negev and the plain, that is the valley of Jericho, the city of palm trees, as far as Zohar. I wish I have a, a clear map to show you the northeast, southwest area that God has, show, has shown to Moses, because Moses couldn't enter in, right? So God says, okay, I'll show you the land. Okay, this is like Google Earth. Yeah, isn't it amazing? We, we think that technology is advanced these days and we have Google Earth, right? But God already knows about Google Earth a long time ago. And I pray that he will show us Google Heaven. <laughs> right, north, south, east, west. Then it's like the north part of the land of Canaan. Natalie, Ephraim, Manasseh, referring to the... Um, east part of it, Judah, the west, and Zohar, the south. So the entire land got showed to Moses, but it was very far away from Mount Avarim. Could Moses have seen it with his own physical eyes? Not possible. 
God opened up his spiritual eyes and allowed him to see. It's Google Earth, truly Google Earth technology, um, spiritual Google Earth technology that enabled, enabled Moses to see. And in um, Deuteronomy verse 7, okay, it says that Moses' eyes were not dim. That means God gave him very spiritually bright eyes. And in verse 1, it says that God made Moses inspect and look very closely as though he could zoom in. It's like using our phone and zooming in. He could see everything, okay? And this is only possible because God gave him the spiritual eyes. So I pray today in the same way, God will also give us that spiritual eyes to inspect closely his kingdom so that we will long for it. Amen? Oh, Plains of Moab. Then we think that, okay, we can surely make it in without any problem. But at the Plains of Moab, which means um, father's offspring or from the father, uh, the Israelites committed acts of immorality with the Moabite woman here in Numbers chapter 25. Okay. We see the picture um, showing that the men dancing with uh, some women. This is not a very good reflection of how beautiful they are. I'll show you a better one later, which I think we've all seen it uh, maybe at one point in time. Numbers tw ch chapter 25, verse 1 and 2 tells us, well, while Israel remained at Shittim, the people began to commit infidelity with the daughters of Moab, for they invited the people to the sac sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. What happened here? Why when they reached the plains of Moab, which is so close to entering to Canaan, um, these beautiful women came to entertain the men of Israelites? Is it because God wanted to give them a reward? Now, the Israelites, they were not really, uh, um, how should I say? They were not really people who were very, uh, had a lot of weapons or uh, training in uh, war, warfare and battles. But as they traveled along the wilderness journey, they were able to gain victory and win battles against different nations before reaching to this place, Plains of Moab. The people of Moab, the king of Moab, when they looked at the Israelites, oh, this is really a fearful nation that's coming forward. Okay, what can we do to overcome them, to weaken them? There's no point fighting against them because they might just win again. Okay, but then they looked at where, where is their weakness? Now, so they looked at the women that they have beside them, okay, Israelites women. And they look at their own Moabite women and they realized, wow, it can't be that the men won't fall for it, right? So they used their sensuous uh, women as weapons to weaken and to overcome the Israel men. Halatri at the plains of Moab. Okay, this is the beautiful picture that I told you about that Imagine this beautiful, full makeup, uh, you know, woman with full makeup and wearing very nice clothing, nice material with perfume, compared to the women journeying in the wilderness for 40 years without changing their clothing, just one set of clothing, one set of outfit, you know, for all occasions. And uh, with very rough uh, hands and feet, strong arms, no slender bodies. So, <laughs> which one is better? <laughs> yeah, so, no choice, right? They have to go for this. Once, just one time, because after this one time, I, I'm going to the promised land and live as God's people. So, this, just this one time, God will forgive. He has given me so much grace, He will be able to forgive even this time. But no, okay, as a result, they not only committed uh, sexual immorality with these women, they also bowed down to their gods and worshipped their gods. So one thing led to another. Or rather, they had to worship their gods before they could, you know, have some engagement with these women. So this is really a time for us, I mean, uh, a chance for us to reflect. This is the, like the last chance 
of repentance before entering in. Do we let go of that chance? Do we let loose or do we hold on to the word of God? As a result of this incident, God sent a huge plague and 24,000 people died. Yeah, so they had to witness another 24,000 of them dying before marching into the Canaan land. So let's be very careful today. What is our spiritual idolatry? It's found in Colossians 3.5. We have to put to death whatever is earthly in us. Whatever is fleshly and earthly, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. The other events that took place um, in the plains of Moab is uh, they took the second census and they also um, defeated the median knights. As a result of this whole um, sexual immorality, uh, act, idolatry act that they did, there was a war that broke out, uh, but they defeated the median knights. And then the last event is uh, Moses reiterated the law to the second generation. This is like a, a aftermath of um, the whole incident. God told Moses, teach them the word again. Teach this second generation the word carefully and powerfully. Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 3 and 5, um, they use a different word, but both word, um, I'll, I'll read for you, okay. Verse 3, in the 40th year, on the first day of the 11th month, Moses spoke to the people of Israel according to all that the Lord had given him in commandment to them. Moses spoke. And uh, verse 5, it says, Beyond the Jordan, in the land of Moab, Moses undertook to explain this law, saying. So both words, spoke and explain, um, is used in, in an emphatic form in the original language. In verse 5, this word explain is ba'ar, and in verse 3, this word spoke is uh, dabar. And these words are emphasized in a very intensive uh, emphatic form. So telling us that God is telling Moses to proclaim that word powerfully and very carefully. So in Revelation chapter 10, verse 12, it also tells us that in the end time, the word of God will be opened and proclaim in a very detailed manner and very clearly to us. This is, this is the end time, means like the last campsite before entry into the promised land. What we must do is to hold fast to that word and to walk in his ways. In Hebrew, okay, the word to cling or to hold fast, which appears in the verse references above uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 10 and 30, the word hold fast is dabak, which means to cleave to, just as man and woman cling on to one another and cleave to one another, um, in, as, as uh, uh, written in Genesis chapter 2, that we have to become one with the word. We have to become one with our Father. We have to be of our Father. We have to be truly from our Father. Now, this this plains of Moab, this place, Moab also means from the Father because um, Moab okay, um, originated from the son who was born to Lot. Remember Lot, Abraham's nephew? So Lot's first daughter gave birth to Moab with, his fa with her father. This is incest, right? So God... Um, actually cursed these people because Lot's daughters got their father drunk and slept with him. Now to, to, to the people of Moab, God said that they will not enter into the assembly of God. Okay. So the land of Moab, or plains of Moab, is the land of cursed people. We are also cursed people. Okay. But we can be restored when we fully and truly repent and cling on to Jesus and the word and we cling on to being our father's children. Last campsite, Gilga. We crossed the Red Sea, uh, sorry, the Jordan, and we are going into Gilga. 
Pilgrim means, today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. That's written in Joshua 5.9. And reproach of Egypt, what does it mean? Reproach of Egypt. When they came up from Egypt, they carried all the Egyptian waste. Egypt represented the war as we uh, spoke about earlier. All the uh, fleshly thoughts and worldly ways, all the grumblings and sinful behavior, all this, they have, they will be rolled away, okay, when we come into God's kingdom. And Gilgal is inside Canaan. Joshua 4, 19 tells us that. That Gilgal is inside Jericho, is inside Canaan. So inside of Canaan, when, after they crossed over, once they arrived, they set up 12 stones of memoria, that's memoria. They arrived on the 10th day of the first month. And there, they circumcised the sons of Israel. Do I have them here? Okay, yes. So they performed circumcision for the second generation after they arrived. Okay, what the, that circumcision was for them to be acknowledged as God's people, but they couldn't do it during the wilderness journey because they, had, they were traveling through the wilderness, stopping and camping, setting up camps. So, so they, they did it once they entered into uh, Gilgal and they celebrated their Passover in the Promised Land, that first Passover, and manna stopped right after that celebration. And so we enter into Gilga and Canaan. Uh, it will be more beautiful than this, of course. This is just a representation. So conclusion. Through this whole entire journey, this map of 42 camps okay, is the first time um, in history that uh, these 42 camps have been plotted. Okay, um, in such a way, and the uh, text has been organized, um, explained to us in a very uh, clear manner, allowing us to entirely realize that this whole journey uh, does not just speak about history of the Israelites' uh, wilderness journey, but it also relates to our life of faith. So this is not just a map of um, that, uh, the Israelites' journey, but a map of our church life. Okay? And uh, Acts chapter 7, verse 38 refers to uh, the, the congregation who came up from uh, Egypt into the wilderness as, uh, sorry, the, the Israelites who came up from Egypt to the wilderness as the assembly or the congregation. So, and in the Greek word is ecclesia, which is translated commonly into uh, as church today. So this is our church life. So we are also called out into this church, this wilderness to be trained as God's people. And when we look at this wilderness journey, um, as we study it again and again, we have to really see two things. Okay? One is we have to find Jesus in it. The whole entire journey prophesies about Jesus coming, his dwelling with us, also his death on the cross, and the salvation that he will give us, and furthermore, to his second coming. It also tells us about our story our, of our own, own life from Egypt to Canaan. So I pray that we will be able to find um, Jesus in the wilderness journey and think about our own wilderness journey and our, well, where we are, which campsite we are at and think about how we want to carry on walking this journey with our God. It took them very long. Why? 40 years. They could have entered, you know, in two years, but it took them 40 years because they did not listen well. Okay, it was, number two, it says here that it was a journey without lack. It was truly a journey that God provided from the first stage to the last stage, God opens up a new way. God provided food, water, con air conditioning, heater, clothes that did not wear out, sent hornets to drive out their enemies. And in Deuteronomy chapter 1, verse 31, it says that God carried them through the wilderness like a man carries his son. 
So we don't have to worry about basic needs when God is journeying with us in this life. And we don't have to worry about our salvation and assurance of faith when Jesus is already given to us as our assurance. His righteousness is already given to us when we become his people. So that holiness that we want to have to attain in order to become you know, people who possess the land is, is not achieved by our own uh, abilities, but Jesus himself, his holiness and his righteousness, we can, God has given to us. But there's one thing that stops us from journeying or carrying on the journey further, or may even die in the wilderness. It, that would be our greed, our rumblings and our complaints. The biggest thing is our greed and the focus on ourselves. When the Israelites came out of the wilderness journey, um, in Exodus chapter 12, verse 37 to 38, it says that when they journeyed out from Ramesses to Sukkoth, uh, a mixed multitude came up with them. Okay, mixed multitude are people who tagged along. They were actually from other nations. They don't necessarily believe in what, you know, the covenant of God is or, you know, where they're headed towards in the promised, what promised land, what that promised land is about. But they wanted to only gain benefits for themselves. And in Numbers 11, 4 tells us that these are also uh, called the rebels. So people who think about their own gains, they don't care about fulfilling God's redemptive plan. We, we don't think about these people, this mixed multitude and rebels as other people, but inside of us, do we also have this mixed multitude where we don't really care about God's plan? We don't really care. We come to church because we have some kind of gain. We can some, some kind of recognition. Sometimes when we do well, people will come, oh, hey, you've done well, you know, because in the church, everyone is like so nice, right? Or certain other kind of benefits that we're seeking for. If we have this kind of attitude in us, then we have that rebels inside of us. Amos 5.13 says that a prudent person keeps silent at evil times. So when we, when we face times of trouble, when we see things that are not going the way we expected, rather than complaining, we have to keep silent, but we have to pray and seek God. When we grumble, we only put the focus back on ourselves. When we grumble, it's because our own physical needs are not met. We focus too much on our own expectations. And this is exactly what Satan wants. He wants us to become dissatisfied, to think about our own condition, and to spread that disease to others. Set ourselves away from the body of Christ, away from the church, away from God's redemptive purpose. Go back to caring only about myself. So when we grumble, when we focus on ourselves, when we become stubborn and obstinate, we cannot hear God's word. So Moses was such a great leader, right? But even at that point in time, in the incident uh, of the waters of Meribah, Moses could not believe and trust in God during that incident. So imagine even Moses, who has been a faithful servant of God, a great leader, cannot at that point trust in God. He forgot. I mean, thinking about that, I'm thinking, who am I? I, I don't have a tenth of who Moses is. So, though we understand that um, for Moses, it was really tough, a very harsh condition, because the people's complaint, their complaints were really, really very hard for him. We have to remember that even when situation becomes really harsh, as people of God, we have to cling on even tighter to God and trust and find comfort in His Word. This journey is not about my needs and my anger and my ways, but where God leads and where He wants me to head towards. So where does He want us to head towards and what does He want for us? What does God want for us? Is to possess the land. We must conquer and repossess the land that has been lost to Satan and the world. In the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve, they were God's people. But because of sin, they were taken out of that land. So we have to go back in and repossess that land. That land also refers to the land of our heart, right? That has been lost to Satan and the world. We have to think not only um, of our own land, this heart, but we also think about all the people around in the church, the, the lost hearts that are around us. So as people 
who want to mature in faith, okay, when we face uh, difficult situations, rather than becoming a victim uh, ourselves, we have to think about how we can support others and not stumble others. Because together, we want to enter into the promised land together. We want to complete this journey together as a church. The reproach of all believers will disappear when Christ returns. We are longing now for a second coming, aren't we? Not. Let's read this final verse and end here. Okay, uh, First Thessalonians chapter 4, 16 to 17. Let's read it together. Ready, go. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel, and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then... We who are alive, we who are left, will be caught up together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. Amen. So mature believers, we must walk faithfully in this journey. We pen thoroughly and really seek God and ask to be born again. Okay? We, we want to be the inheritors of God's kingdom. We have to really honor our God and become his people who will follow him, his will. So let's remove that focus on ourselves and place, replace that focus, you know, on God's purpose for the redemption of and restoration of the fallen world and men. Let's close with prayer. Father, we want to thank you, Father, for showing us this entire map of the wilderness journey and helping us to understand how it relates to our life. Help us, Father, to be um, really looking to you to your thoughts, to your ways. Father, you know that we are weak, so at times when we fall back and on ourselves, in our own ways, Father, remind us and help us to quickly, Father, lean on you again. We want to really uh, successfully enter into the promised land. We pray, Father, that you would be with every church member and help us through our difficulties and help us to see and inspect your kingdom closely so that we have new hope. We always, Father, hope in that kingdom and we always, Father, will follow your ways and walk with you no matter what. We thank you so much. We commit all this, um, the rest of the day into your hands and all these uh, studies that we are continuing to have. May you, Father, continue to open up our hearts and our spiritual ears and eyes so that we may truly understand you and truly love you through the word. Thank you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.